Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicolas Groya from EBMT, and together with my co-chair, Pavan Reddy from the ASTCT, we are proud and happy to chair this session, uh, this common session from EBMT and ASTCT, with the treatment options of COVID-19 patients with specific focus on stem cell transplantation and CAR T cells. So we have four distinguished speakers. So this is Pavan Reddy from the US. We have four distinguished speakers. We have Alfana Wagmer from the US. We have Margosata, Margosata Mikuska uh, from Italy. We have Senia Papanicolao from the US, from New York. And then we have Per Lungman uh, from Stockholm, Sweden, from Europe. And we will start, with, yeah. I think we'll get started. Our first speaker for the session is Dr. Alpana Wagmeyer from, uh, as Nicholas said, from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, Seattle. She will talk to us about antivirals and the consideration for COVID-19 in transplant and CAR T cell patients. Alpana, thank you for doing this. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak about antivirals um, under consideration for COVID-19. Those are my disclosures. So a few general considerations about antiviral therapy for SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus or COVID-19. Uh, it's important to note there are several agents that have been administered to patients around the world. Many of these agents have been um, administered in an uncontrolled fashion and in combination with many other unapproved agents. Uh, which is a caveat to understanding the effect of any antiviral on the outcome of disease. Uh, new data regarding antivirals is coming out almost daily, um, especially in this last week, uh, including newer results from randomized controlled trials. There are several issues outstanding even with these results um, in terms of the uh, both for trial design, but also for clinical care. Um, the, the disease itself uh, uh, has different stages, and it's not clear exactly what stage an antiviral should be administered versus some of the other uh, agents that will be discussed later in the session. And there's clearly very uh, little published data, excuse me, on the efficacy and safety uh, of antiviral agents that are being explored in the HCT or immunotherapy patients. Next slide. So here's a, a modified um, um, a limited list of antivirals that are under consideration. Uh, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about remdesivir and lopinavir ritonavir, which are the first two in this table. Um, others that have been considered but are um, where, where there's very little data is uh, uh, DAS-181 and um, most recently uh, favipiravir. Slide, please. So remdesivir is a nucleotide prodrug which inhibits RNA polymerase and terminates RNA uh, viral RNA transcription. Uh, this agent had been studied um, in animal and uh, in vitro models of for MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1, and then in in vitro models of SARS-CoV-2. And these two figures are from that last paper where they demonstrated inhibition of uh, and cytotoxicity with um, uh, in vitro models for SARS-CoV-2. Most recently, we have new clinical data on the use of remdesivir uh, in mostly healthy, I'm sorry, not healthy, uh, mostly adult populations. Uh, again, reminding you that none of these are in um, cancer or HCT or immunotherapy populations. So the first study um, that recently came out was a uh, a recap or a summary of a compassionate use program through sponsored through the, the company that makes the drug, Gilead. This was a study with 53 patients um, that had severe disease, uh, which meant uh, requiring some uh, a level of oxygen um, use. Next slide. So uh, in this group, there were 19 uh, subjects that required non-invasive mechanical ventilation and 34 that started on invasive mechanical ventilation. The median age was 64 with an interquartile range of 48 to 71. 
uh, several subjects had comorbidities, the most common being hypertension. Um, and the outcomes that were evaluated uh, included oxygen support class, which they, in this group, 68% uh, did improve, 47% were discharged, and they reported a 13% mortality. The curves on the right, the middle curve, uh, shows the baseline oxygen support and the difference in the, um, the improvement between patients that started on invasive versus non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, this is nice data to have, but it's important to remember that this has, um, there was no comparator arm in this group, so it's only describing subjects that received remdesivir through the Compassionate Use Program. So value in, in determining efficacy. Next slide, please. The second study that recently came out came from China, which was a randomized double-blind placebo um, placebo control trial, uh, where there were 237 patients evaluated that had severe COVID-19, which required oxygen. Next slide. In this study, they, uh, the interval from symptom onset to enrollment was 12 days or less. And the study did allow for concomitant use of other agents, including lopinavir, ritonavir, interferons, and corticosteroids. There were 158 subjects in the remdesivir arm, 78, 79 in the placebo arm. The outcomes, the main outcomes of interest were um, time to clinical improvement by day 28. And here they did not show that there was a difference between remdesivir and the placebo arm. They did look specifically at patients that had symptoms, uh, symptom duration of less than 10 days, and they showed a trend towards faster resolution, but that did not re uh, reach statistical significance. The two panels on the bottom show the effect on the viral load um, as measured in the upper respiratory and lower respiratory tracts, and they did not see an effect on the viral load either. It's important to know that this study did not finish enrollment uh, of the full sample size, and because of the resolution of the pandemic um, in the, the study sites, but um, so was actually underpowered for the effect that they were looking for. Next slide. And then finally, there were two additional um, studies that were uh, reported in press releases. One is the National Institute of Health trial that evaluated um, remdesivir versus placebo in a randomized double-line placebo controlled trial. There were 1,000 plus patients enrolled in the study that had either moderate, severe, or critical disease. Uh, a press release last week demonstrated um, the results of an inter interim analysis where they showed a me the median time to recovery was lower, 11 versus 15 days, in the remdesivir versus placebo group. The results also suggested a survival benefit with a um, quality rate that did not achieve statistical significance. Um, it's important to realize that this is all the data that's available right now, We're waiting for um, additional uh, data about subgroup analysis, et cetera, but this is the interim analysis um, and the data that was published. And then finally, there was one additional study that um, sponsored by Gilead itself that evaluated five versus 10 days of therapy in patients that were um, with severe COVID-19 and demonstrated that there wasn't a difference between the, those two durations of therapy. Uh, adverse reactions from remdesivir, most common is the liver enzyme elevation, other GI symptoms, um, and um, some um, uh, cytopenias that were reported. But um, again, these are in these two smaller studies, We're still waiting for the adverse events from the larger studies. Lopinavir is a proteus inhibitor used in HIV that was used for SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV and did demonstrate some clinical benefit in a few studies. There was a randomized open-label um, trial that was conducted in, in China um, where the primary endpoint time to clinical resolution as well as secondary endpoints including mortality and um, uh, resolution of detectable RNA levels. Uh, those two endpoints, or all of those endpoints, excuse me, were not met. Um, and, and in general, um, the use of lopinavir ritonavir is not recommended for COVID-19. Next slide. 
Um, so those are the, the drugs, I think, that are on the top of the list for antivirals. Uh, I did have a few comments on the antiviral therapeutic strategy. Um, as I mentioned before, there's very little data for mild to moderate disease, um, and optimal timing of antiviral therapy has not yet been determined. I will say, though, there are several trials now that are evaluating agents at an earlier time point to see if there, that uh, has a better efficacy for um, severe outcomes. Um, in general, our approach has been that hospitalized patients with evidence of lower tract disease can be considered for therapy, but it's really a multidisciplinary discussion with the primary team, infectious diseases, the ICU, pharmacy, et cetera, especially when you uh, considering antivirals versus other anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, I will emphasize again that there's no uh, very little data in HCT or immunotherapy patients, but we hope that there will be more data forthcoming. Um, and then for, especially for HCT and immunotherapy, uh, the choice of agents should also depend on um, the consideration of drug-drug interactions and toxicity. And then just to emph emphasize that the recommendations will continue to change as data become available. Thank you, uh, Alpana. Um, uh, Thank you, Alpana. I think we'll uh, move on. Each speaker gets 10 minutes, and then we'll take questions the last 20 minutes. Um, our next speaker is going to focus on the role of chloroquine and anti-inflammatory drugs uh, in treatment of COVID-19 on transplant wards. Uh, we welcome Dr. Margareta Mikulska, who is uh, coming to us from University of Genoa, Genoa, Italy. Um, Dr. Mikulska, please. Take over. Thank you very Good much. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to be in this webinar and share uh, the information on chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and immuno um, anti inflammatory drugs. So, we've all learned that COVID 19 has two phases that may overlap the viral one and the inflammatory one. Um, we know that um, in these phases, the treatment required might be different. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, even though they are included um, along with remdesivir as antiviral uh, treatment, because they do have antiviral activity, they have also immunomodulation potential. Uh, for anti-inflammatory um, part, we will discuss corticosteroids and uh, drugs interfering with interleukin-6. Next, please. So um, we know that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, they are in vitro active against SARS-CoV-2 with higher activity for hydroxychloroquine. We know that in many studies, different doses were used that varied um, hugely from one study to another, and they are higher than in rheumatology. And we also know that the side effects are uh, gastrointestinal toxicity, retinopathy, which can be irreversible and which has been assessed in rheumatological disorders. And there's also the potential for cardiac toxicity, particularly prolongation of QT interval, which may be very important if we give other drugs that prolong QT interval. Next, please. So um, as far as efficacy in real life in patients is concerned, these are the data showing the efficacy. We have a randomized Chinese trial uh, in 62 patients that reported shorter time to clinical recovery in the arm of hydroxychloroquine treated patients. And we have two observational studies that got huge press coverage, as you can remember, both from friends from the same group that um, used hydroxychloroquine uh, in the second trial in all patients with uh, azithromycin as well. And they reported a very high rate of PCR negativity at day A, being 100% in only six patients included in double therapy in the first trial, and 93% in um, 80 patients included in, uh, in the second trial. However, we have also the data that did not show the efficacy of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in real life. We have some small and larger series from China and from Europe, from France, that did not show the benefit on 
um, clinical signs or PCR negativity in the patients. And then we have the randomized clinical trial in Chinese patients in 150 patients with mild or moderate COVID-19, um, where there was no benefit on viral clearance. And you can see the graph in the upper right side that around 50% of the patients at day seven were still positive in both arms. So this is in contrast to the French data. And there was also a prospective analysis of patients hospitalized in different US centers that reported rates of death higher in the hydroxychloroquine treated patients than in those who did not receive hydroxychloroquine. And this difference remained even after adjusting for gravity of the disease at the clinical onset or at the hospital admission. So these are the data that show no uh, benefit of hydroxychloroquine. Next, please. And then we have studies that reported on safety. The uh, aforementioned Chinese trial uh, showed quite a good uh, safety profile of high dose hydroxychloroquine with diarrhea being the most common side effect occurring in 10% versus zero in placebo arm or in standard of care arm. And there's also the halted randomized trial in Brazil that was stopped due to safety concerns in 80 patients that received either high dose chloroquine or lower dose chloroquine. Um, and the death was very frequent in the higher dose arm with 39% uh, compared to lower dose arm, which um, reported death in 15% of patients. There was the prolongation of QT interval and it might be also due to concomitant treatments with azithromycin or ozeltamivir. Next, please. So um, going now to anti-inflammatory treatments, uh, steroids are the most um, easily accessible choice. At the beginning, their use was discouraged by uh, WHO and um, international uh, societies. Due to undocumented benefit in previous um, SARS uh, infections and the fear of potential increase in viral proliferation and side effects. Uh, up to today, we have only one trial, one published trial that showed the benefit of short term steroid therapy in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome with COVID 19. And the difference was statistically significant. Um, and steroid treatment has been included in Chinese guidelines for, for treatment. Next, please. Um, Anti-interleukin-6 treatment got a lot of attention because it has been shown that high levels of um, interleukin-6 were associated with mortality. Um, now we have the data from two studies that have been peer-reviewed and uh, properly published. In these studies, steroids were also administered, but their impact was not analyzed separately. And these are uh, two cohorts of 21 and 15 patients. Most of them were severe. And in the first study, all patients improved and all were discharged. And the dose of tocilizumab used was four to eight milligram per kilogram, mainly 400 milligram per dose. And in the second trial in 15 patients, uh, the dose was variable. You can see it from 80 to 600 milligrams. And um, some patients were stable after the treatment and one third deteriorated or died. We have also the preprint information on 21 patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome and COVID-19 treated with siltuximab. Um, and uh, in this cohort, uh, roughly 25% deteriorated almost half were stable and one third improved. Next, please. Um, as far as safety of tocilizumab is concerned, we have no significant side effects reported in two Chinese studies. Um, in our personal experience, that there has been increase in liver enzymes in many patients. It was mainly mild and transient, and we had uh, some cases of transient rash and neutropenia. We also observed a higher rate of uh, bloodstream infections in ICU patients, but these may depend on many different factors. And there are many ongoing trials or anti-inflammatory therapy in COVID-19. 
and they focus on tocilizumab, on other anti-interleukin-6 inhibitors, on steroids, and many, many other anti-inflammatory drugs, including, including JAK kinases and so on. Next, please. So what we do know now is that inflammatory cytokine, cytokine storm is very common in mainly immunocompetent patients with severe COVID-19. Um, we know that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine um, have some studies showing that they work, some studies showing that they did not work. Uh, so they probably should be used within randomized controlled trials. Um, but we know very little about anti-inflammatory therapy in transplant recipients. We know that lab changes that, that um, are present in these patients, they coexist in viral phase and inflammatory phase of the disease. And in transplant recipients, we have numerous various reasons for lymphopenia, for increase of CRP, ferritin increase, and so on. So it's not easy now to judge the role of anti-inflammatory treatment in immunocompromised patients with severe COVID-19. Thank you very much. So we continue with the next speaker. So the next topic is, is a convalescence plasma for treatment of COVID-19 patients. And the presentation will be given by Senia Papanikolaou. She's from the Infectious Disease Service from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, also professor at the Wade Cornell Medical College, also in New York. So Senia, please. in the US and my personal experience setting this program at my institution, Memorial Sloan Kettering. So typically we um, want to know the four W's, why, what, and who, and when. Uh, and for this instance, uh, actually, it uh, seems that we have jumped into how. And um, one of the reasons is that a plasma is not actually a product, but is a selfless gift. Uh, and it's given from an individual donor to an individual recipient. So logistics are very important. But let's start with the why. Uh, what is the rationale that uh, plasma would work? Well, we know that passive antibody transfer is a short term strategy. It provides immediate immunity to individuals that are uh, naive. They do not know, they do not have a preceding immunity. Um, they are susceptible individuals uh, and it's most effective in preventing infections or when the patients are manifesting early signs of infection, it can blunt the response to infection. It can either make it milder or make it uh, the duration shorter. Now, there is a less a hope for an effect in the treatment of disease from what we have previously known. However, there are examples that it has been used for treatment of disease. And it's been used over a century for various diseases, including influenza, Ebola, measles, etc. It has also been used before in the previous pathogenic human coronaviruses, SARS and MERS and we have limited experience with COVID-19. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what we, um, why we think it would work or what would work in the plasma is the neutralizing antibodies. These are antibodies that uh, prevent uh, fusion, docking of the uh, virus to its recipients in human cells and uh, prevent also viral fusion. And in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we believe that uh, these are antibodies against the receptor binding domain and the HR2 domain of the uh, trimeric spike protein. And uh, these are the type of antibodies that also interact with other components of the immune system and uh, together they confer this antibody mediated uh, toxicity and protection from disease. Uh, however, uh, other antibodies that are low quality or in low quantities, they may be internalized by uh, cells that do not express the receptors for the virus 
and create an inflammatory response. And that hasn't been actually a theoretical concern. Uh, the, the, the term used is antibody dependent enhancement, a theoretical concern of actually uh, making the disease worse while if you infuse this type of non-neutralizing low quality antibodies. Next. This is our clinical experience with plasma uh, in COVID-19. Well, uh, not a lot. There are studies from China, uh, which consist of uh, a case series of 10 patients in the one study and five patients in the other study. There were uh, different um, types of uh, uh, different quantities of neutralizing antibodies in, in these uh, products. And what's important is that there was no uh, safety effect and there was improvement in the clinical status of the patient. So there was a, a faster time to recovery, improvement in oxygenation and all of these uh, good outcomes that we want of note. All these patients received also a lot of other concomitant treatments, including anything that could be used as antiviral or even a steroid. So this is actually um, what we know. Next. So what is my assessment? Well, um, it's promising. Um, no safety concern in these uh, few patients and some uh, signal of uh, safety. But these are uncontrolled series. Uh, there were concomitant treatments given and there was poorly characterized plasma. So um, next slide. What we can conclude is convalescent plasma has not been yet shown to be safe and effective as treatment for COVID-19 and randomized clinical trials are needed. Uh, and this is actually the guidance that came out from the FDA in the middle of March. And around that time, a group of uh, 57 physicians from 46 states self-organized themselves to create the National Convalescent Plasma Project with their goal to evaluate the safety and efficacy of plasma, but also the primary goal of making plasma available to patients as treatment in the middle of the pandemic. And the group consists of uh, a specialist from blood bank and transfusion medicine, clinical trialists, virology and communication. And uh, I, I give the, um, the, the sites that because they contain useful information uh, for uh, key scientific papers, uh, sharing protocols, sharing informed consent and other useful information. Yes, next slide. So where we stand now, um, the, um, in the US we have the expanded access program where 2000 sites have been registered and over 4500 transfusion treatments uh, administered. The data is very preliminary. Uh, the purpose of this access uh, program is to evaluate safety. But even for that, I would say that the data is very premature. There are no immediate safety signals of concern as far as we know. However, analysis is ongoing. And the next step is to see if we discern any signal for efficacy in these patients that were treated. Uh, clearly, these patients are very diverse with regards to the severity of their disease and have received very heterogeneous plasma products. Uh, in the there was no, while a, a titer of 1 to 160 was recommended, uh, it is known that many blood centers did not have the ability to test for antibodies and therefore the plasma was infused without any knowledge of the antibody content. In retrospect, what we know is that approximately 30% of the donors do not have adequate titers from what titers we are actually measuring now. Um, and again, the big question is that this process, this program, launched at the same time that the quest for an antibody test uh, was uh, ongoing and thus in the beginning the tests for antibodies are uh, were not um, 
antibodies were not uh, available, and uh, even if they are available, we still do not understand the correlation between titers and patient outcomes. So uh, beyond the expanded access program, we are gearing up for randomized clinicals, and there are um, a couple of them. So one is post-exposure prophylaxis uh, or prophylaxis in um, individuals which would be either healthcare workers or um, people of uh, high risk that have uh, are, are in close contact with uh, patients with COVID-2. Uh, there is a trial for early treatment where we believe that this would make most sense in blunting the clinical manifestations. And there is a rescue ICU protocol where uh, we think that this is less likely to work. Uh, however, in this uh, protocol, it's planned to give uh, six doses of plasma. There is a pediatric uh, group that also is putting together pediatric trials, including post-exposure and treatment for hospitalized severely sick patients. Uh, next slide. Now, so, the plasma donors have to meet criteria for blood donation and also have to meet eligibility for COVID plasma donation, uh, which is actually a big hurdle. Initially, the FDA said that the patient needed to be asymptomatic from COVID for at least 14 days and have a repeat swab negative for COVID. Subsequently, uh, it was modified to say that if the patients had been asymptomatic for 28 days, then the uh, repeat swab was not required. And most recently, there was another um, revision stating that a serologic, a positive serologic test for COVID is acceptable proof for a COVID, um, past COVID infection. Again, discussed that uh, with the current antibody testing, approximately 30% of donors may not have qualified or may not qualify. Uh, and major blood centers are coming out with automated standardized antibody testing. However, individual hospitals still are testing with uh, individual patients. And still, we don't know the relationship of titers to patient outcomes. Now, moving from plasma to uh, COVID hyperimmune globulin, such a product would be useful, particularly after the pandemic, if uh, there is seasonal COVID uh, for the uh, patients at highest risk and patients perhaps that would not uh, respond to vaccination or if we still don't have an effective treatment. And there is uh, interest for uh, from the major manufacturers to fractionate plasma and create a standardized product from a pool of donors. There are still FDA regulatory issues to be involved. Uh, I'm going to give now my personal opinion uh, with uh, personal experience with setting the plasma product pro program at Sloan Kettering. Uh, it has been a very exhilarating, but also a humbling experience. We collected plasma from our employees that had been infected with COVID and we collected them at our own blood bank. And so it uh, has been, um, um, there are no words to describe all these healthcare workers that came forward to donate plasma and uh, all of the pieces, all the people that were involved, including the laboratory medicine to create the antibody testing assay the blood bank to set up the procedures for collection of plasma, a clinical research, uh, IRB, um, health informatics, and foremost, the clinicians uh, that administered the plasma to approximately 15, to approximately 50 patients now. Um, now, from logistics to science, this is my last slide. We started to run before learning to walk. Uh, we had to institute this uh, uh, program in the midst of pandemic. Uh, we are still uh, mining data at the national level. Uh, implementation for data sharing is important. And then we have to understand the science behind it. And so we need virologists, immunologists, uh, and clinical trialists to understand the antibody response. 
how we move from plasma to a central distillery that will produce hyperimmune globulin and what is the optimal use? Uh, when should we give it? And ideally, this modality should work better in combination as adjunct therapy with antiviral and other treatments. And still, there's a lot to learn to bring the right product to the right patient at the right time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Papandikilago, for this very nice and interesting presentation. So we come to the last speaker, which will be Professor Per Ljungman from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And his presentation is focusing on vaccines against COVID-19, hope or hype. Please, Per. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, it's interesting to be last in this symposium and realize that if we start from Dr. Wagmar and go down the line, we get less and less data to talk about. And since I'm lost, I have the least data to talk about and regarding vaccines. And that's the question, hype or hope. That means that we have very little data, but there is a lot of opinions about vaccines available out in the public domain and also in um, media and discussion everywhere. Um, so, I will talk a little bit about the thinking of, about transplant patients, because to vaccinate a transplant patient is not the same as to vaccinate a healthy individual or, for example, hospital staff. So, this will be regarding COVID vaccines opinions and not really uh, very much knowledge and facts. Next. So, there are many different uh, vaccines in different stages of development. And this is a slide from uh, about a month ago coming out uh, regarding uh, the number of different vaccines, topics, types of vaccines, and where uh, everybody is working. So, as you can see and you can count it, there are many, many potential vaccines. And we probably um, all realize that only a couple of these will ever come to uh, clinical use. Next. Um, looking at the clinicaltrials.gov uh, last Sunday, there are 11 trials uh, presented, and six of these are recruiting, three in China, two in the US, and one in the UK. Next. And these are the six different trials, all of them different, two of them uh, more similar, and that's the adenovirus vector uh, trials, both expressing S protein, the spike protein of the coronavirus. And the largest of these is the University of Oxford trial that is planned to include a thousand individuals in a phase one, two setting. Uh, but all of them are very early. So, what is then needed before we can start with vaccination outside study? Well, obviously we need convincing safety data. And all these early studies, phase one studies, are uh, mainly, mainly safety studies. Uh, and then we come back to the question that, all, that was uh, discussed by Senia and that we will discuss in the uh, beginning of the question and answer sessions. Uh, the immune response, you know, what, how are we going to assess protection by a vaccine and in whom healthy young people, elderly, immunocompromised patients, they are very likely to be different. Another question that is, of course, completely unknown at this time, and the answer to is knowledge about the durability of the response. You know, do we will have we will have to vaccinate patients once yearly as we do with influenza, or are we going to uh, have a vaccine with longer durability of response? And we can only guess about that. We have to know a defined dosing: one dose, two doses, any number of doses. The production of these vaccines have to be scalable. And we have to have a well-functioning distribution system. This is a worldwide crisis, and we talk about billions of people that you know should we immunize everybody or subsets. And I will get back to that 
in a minute. But both these later two are clearly major challenges. So where are we then with the potential vaccine? Well, when you read the media and you hear people discussing, there are the two extremes. One is an extremely positive time frame that we will have first results after the summer this year, if possibly production start fall winter 2020 and possible first implementation in spring 20. That's the positive extreme. The much more likely scenario is that we might get some results during the fall, we need uh, in uh, the winter and spring. And if possible, positive, then production can start in the summer of 2021, so a year from now, and then implementation maybe 18 months from now. And then Worst scenario, of course, is that it won't work. So whom shall we then vaccinate? And this, of course, health policy in, in all countries. Should we do population-based vaccinations? Should we do uh, risk patients, including then transplants? Should we try to protect patients by uh, immunizing healthcare workers or family members of transplant patients? And I will go through this positive and negative or advantage and obstacles with these different options. So if we talk about population-based, well, the advantages is that it might prevent new waves of COVID-19, and you have probably uh, heard in the media, or read in the media about should athletes be immunized before taking part in uh, the Olympics 2021, uh, and it might reduce the burden on the healthcare system. Obstacles, of course, if we're going to go out and immunize an enormous large number of people, we really need an extreme safety profile because we already know that most individuals do not get very sick or by COVID. And then, of course, this is a major challenge on production, distribution, economy. It has to be accepted out in the community. We have the, clearly uh, the uh, uh, groups very uh, opposed to vaccination. What are we going to do if we have a zero positive from the disease? Should they be vaccinated? And again, duration of response and booster. Next. If we go to our own patient population, the transplants, the CVD immunocompromised, well, the advantages is that there's a limited publication, a population. These patients accept vaccination very well. It's usually not the discussion. And it's, of course, most likely a high risk group for more severe COVID. And the obstacles then, well, you know, if we have get immune responses in a healthy population, what can we use that knowledge for in transport? The same goes for safety. When shall we vaccinate the patient? We, this is a major discussion with the vaccines we have today, such as flu. Can all patients be vaccinated with the same schedule? And then, again, then the duration of response. Next, please. Healthcare workers, well, uh, can reduce the risk. It's a limited group, it's a risk group, and then we come into acceptance. We know that it's not that easy to get healthcare workers to get immunized against flu. And we, again, we have to discuss the safety. Next. And finally, another group that, might, that we probably will have acceptance is family members to transplant patients. This has been discussed and we recommend it, for example, for flu. But again, the same potential obstacles as we have discussed. And then we add the problem with children. So these are options and where we will end up. I don't, we have no data to really uh, support either of the strategies, but they will have very different impact. Next. Next slide. Okay, here. So how then we have more than one vaccine candidate, which shall we, how shall we choose? Which shall be the criteria? And there are some ideas about this. The prioritization, production, distribution over the globe, and who is going to decide? National governments, F WHO, United Nations, the companies, the money, the, you know, if you have money, that will get vaccinated. We don't know. And this is important question to solve. And then of course we have to have follow up systems for efficacy and safety. Next. So coming to the end of my presentation, uh, so, um, and this is a way of looking at it. 
next uh, where you know we don't know if the vaccine and what it will do for our patients and for ourselves and in the healthcare profession as well. Next. Thank you very much. And then I will just add a slide to start the discussion because we have mentioned serologic testing. I've done it in the vaccine discussion. Xenia did it for the plasma discussion. And as you also are aware, there are very many tests out there being evaluated commercially and uh, scientifically, and we, at this time point, just don't know. But I think we can we come up with questions how that this test should be used in transplants. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, here, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, Dr. Kroger and I, we will try and collate some of the questions that have been coming through. If folks have more questions, feel free to uh, ask as we answer some of the questions that have come through. Let me start with the first one that came through this morning. Uh, I'd like Dr. Wagmar to take a stab at this. Uh, Alpana, if you could help answer the first one, which is regarding uh, the therapeutic dose for acyclovir. Uh, during this COVID-19 era after autologous stem cell transplantation. Any thoughts on that? The, the dose should be adjusted or? Yes. Um, no, I the, think. The question was, should you use therapeutic dose versus prophylactic dose uh, for acyclovir uh, in this COVID-19 era uh, for autologous transplantation? Um, I'm not aware of any recommendation to do that. I'm not sure if anybody else in the panel has an opinion, but um, I don't know of any data or, I mean, obviously no data, but I don't know of any recommendation for, for doing that. So you would not recommend it? Then? No, not not right now. <laughs> Nicholas, your 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 um, microphone's turned off. Me now. Yes. Oh, oh, turn off again. You can hear me now. Yes. Now we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry about this. So maybe this is a question for Alfana and Margot Sata, but maybe all the others can answer if they have a a proper recommendation. And um, I will go maybe to the third question. And this is about, um, let me see, it's about a drug which is called nitazoxanide. So this is known to work in vitro in MERS-CoV and other coronavirus, and it decreased IL-6 uh, IL in mice. So is anybody of you aware about this drug and how does it work? Any experience in human? has been used in humans for different infections, but I think that we have no data in humans on COVID-19 with nitazoxanide. And um, as we've seen with um, lopinavir and maybe chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, having in vitro activity does not mean that it will translate into clinical activity. So I think that before introducing yet another drug, we should do it in randomized trials after robust in vitro data. Otherwise, we are chasing another potential antiviral. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Okay. Um, well, Alpanika, maybe. Uh... Uh, anybody could take a stab at this. Perhaps Alpen, I can start with it as uh, one of the pediatric doctors on the panel here. Um, the doctors in the UK uh, have been uh, warning about possible COVID-19 related symptoms emerging in children, a rare syndrome. Um, and, and this person would like to know if this is really related to COVID-19 or do we have more accurate information or additional data? Uh, Alpana, anything on COVID-19 and the emerging symptoms in children? I know there have been some recent reports on it as well. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the initial data that we had from China suggested, you know, that children definitely had milder presentations, which I think still is overall true. I think the story that's emerging now is um, whether there is a um, sort of autoimmune or secondary um, post-infectious outcome from COVID-19 and, and related um, hyper-inflammatory symptoms such as Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki-like disease. Um, as, a, as far as I know right now, there, there seems to be an association, but I don't know if we can say if there's a direct link. Um, but uh, that is something um, that is being evaluated both uh, internationally and in the U.S. now um, to try to have a clear case definition and, and try to understand the association better. So your microphone's turned off again. Sorry. Can hear you now. Okay, thanks, Pavan. There's a, a interesting clinical question for everybody. So it's is for all our speakers, and this is regarding uh, transplant patient or transplant hospitalized patients. So um, with lower respiratory infections with COVID, with or without RDS with COVID. So what is the recommendation? Is it really today remdesivir or what else? So this uh, and this speaker wants to or this question wants to know from everybody. A practical recommendation: What they are doing today? What are you doing today in these patients? I can try to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, from our perspective, we do not have yet uh, remdesivir available outside the uh, expanded access program, which is reserved for intubated patients. So when the uh, remdesivir becomes available under the emergency authorization, um, then it will be probably given to severely sick patients. But as of now, we do not have it yet available. I would say the same for us. It's a There are ongoing clinical trials, but not uh, uh, general access. Mm -hmm. used it in immunocompromised patients even without intubation. Um, the problem is that we do not have the, the data in how many patients it would work. So these are single patient experiences in the immunocompromised and we just hope it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay, that one is up to you. Sure. I mean, one of the other questions from the viewers is uh, it relates to the convalescent plasma. Uh, maybe you can take a stab and others can uh, suggest as well. Uh, the question is, uh, is it better if it's done before the cytokine release syndrome? And uh, is it possible that convalescent plasma could be acting through another mechanism besides antibodies? Uh, and uh, they're evoking a potential role for mesenchymal stem cells and plasma. Um, and I, I think you could answer by saying, are there other potential mechanisms this could act? Um, and if you want to take a stab at mesenchymal stem cell, the role of mesenchymal stem cells, that'd be great too. And I think we could start with Xenia and others can uh, help answer the question as well. Claire, any thoughts on that would be great. So this is again a, a personal opinion. Uh, the I believe that plasma has better chance if it's given early in the course of disease. So it is um, more likely to work uh, when it's given early rather than when there is cytokine release syndrome and everything else has failed. The FDA guidance is very broad. So any patient that basically presents with dyspnea uh, can get it, even though other criteria are put forward, like uh, respiratory rate more than 30 and oxygen saturation less than 93. Uh, because the um, the guidance is so loose, everybody that has uh, dyspnea uh, can get plasma. And if it is available, um, it is that would be best time to give it. Now, of course, you run into the situation where many patients would have improved, right, without plasma. 
And again, that's why uh, we, we, we say that uh, randomized clinical trials are needed, but the best use of plasma, in my opinion, would be given early in the disease. Uh, Mesenchyma stem cells. Yes, I, I am agnostic to that. I don't think I can contribute. I know that there are a number of clinical trials ongoing. Um, I, I can't comment any further. Regarding plasma, I think we have to remember the history on plasma and or IVIG for infection. You know, it's one of the most overused commodities in, in medicine with very little supportive data that it actually works in when you talk about the direct antiviral effect. Um, if it's going to work, it should work in a situation where there are enough virus around to neutralize, to prevent things. So for me, I completely agree with Senia that in a general patient population, that would be pretty early. And then to elucidate that effect from a normal improvement is difficult. There is some information in transplants uh, suggesting that patients after transplant might be virus positive for a long time, and there are some patients that might develop a more classic viral pneumonia instead of the cytokine uh, type uh, ARDS. And if that is held up when we start getting larger series of uh, patients, uh, patients reported and data analyzed, that might be a situation where hyperimmune plasma might also be useful to try to, to clear the virus. But this is hypothetical at this time point. Maybe I can have a last question maybe to Senya, but maybe also to the others, because Senya, in New York, you worked a lot in the last 20 years in transplant about T cells against viral infections. So are there any data or, uh, or in your patients who have uh, positive uh, antibody response, have also seen T cell response? Uh, this is a, a very interesting question, and we uh, don't know for for viral pneumonias what is the predominant mechanism. The short answer is that unfortunately, in the midst of pandemics, our uh, laboratory operations were working at the skeleton and uh, specimen biospecimen collection and analysis uh, had been has been extremely scarce. Uh, so while there were a lot of interest to immunophenotype to look at responses, I believe that at least at our institution, we were very strict in uh, scaling down operations and we are reopening now. Other institutions in New York, um, including Mount Sinai and perhaps uh, NYU, um, allowed the specimen collection and may provide more informative um, uh, data. I, I, again, I mean, the role of T cells in this viral pneumonia is, we don't exactly know it. I know that there is an effort from industry to generate COVID specific T cells, um, but where to go with that, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers. I, I still think we have a few more questions here, um, but we already that's over the hour. Um, and uh, on behalf of uh, EBMT and ASDCT, we'd like to thank all the four speakers. Uh, thank you so much for doing it. And I will pass it over to Dr. Kroger to close the session. No, I just echo you. So thanks very much, Pavan, for sharing the session, but more thanks to all the speakers to the uh, excellent presentation and also for the attendings who give this uh, very interesting and very thoughtful questions. So thanks very much and hope you will join us for one of our next meetings. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye and have a nice day. Bye-bye.